And welcome to Pick 6 Movies, the podcast where each season we select six movies all related to a single theme. And then on each episode, we take a look at the people who made one of those movies to answer the question, huh? Then on top of that, we give you a full review of the movie from start to finish to see if it's any good. And more often than not, the movies we review on this podcast are genuinely awful. I'm Chad Cooper, and along with my lifelong friend and podcast co-host, Mr. Bo Ransdell, this season's theme is Domo Arigato, featuring six movies where robots are up to all manner of unexpected hijinks. This is episode five, and boy, do we have a doozy of a movie for you with Chopping Mall. It's everything you want in an 80s slasher movie. Young adults stranded alone, this time in a shopping mall, with a murderous killer, this time, it's three robots. And they stalk down the young adults one by one and they kill them off until the movie ends and you turn it off and you never think twice about it for the rest of your life. Doesn't that sound delightful? <laughs> of course it does. But enough of my jibber jabber. Let's get Mr. Bo Ransdell in here to explain to us how shopping malls destroyed the America of yesteryear only to set the stage for this terrifyingly terrible slasher film. Oh, and there's gratuitous nudity, both male and female. And I guess there's robot nudity, because they don't wear clothes. Can robots be naked? Rosie the robot on the Jetsons, she wore a maid's costume, so I guess if she took it off, she'd be naked. You know what? Yeah, robots can be naked. <laughs> Listen to me jibber jabber on. Let's just get Mr. Bo Ransdell in here to talk about Shopping Mall before I prattle on a little bit more. Bo, do that thing you do. Elizabeth King once wrote, If capitalism is America's religion, the mall is its church. The American urge to consume has been bored into us through decades of advertising and culture. Who doesn't love that feeling when a new box from Amazon shows up at your door? It's a dopamine hit of satisfaction, a release of pleasure on account of you having more stuff. We got rid of the mall and made the stuff come right to us, an advancement in consumerism, but not so much in the world where malls had a different intended purpose. See, malls weren't supposed to be just a place to go and spend money. They were supposed to bring us, as a society, together. Cue the music, fellas. It sounds like an introduction. The guy who first devised the idea of the American shopping mall wasn't some guy in a boardroom eager to put all the things you can buy in one handy place. Nope, it was a Vienna-born architect by the name of Victor Gruen, a socialist of all things. Gruen had noted that people were fleeing urban areas in a wake of industrialization, and he was worried that these suburban spaces where the population was flocking to would, in his words, create a, quote, feminized space where the only people who could possibly live were women and children on account of there being nothing to do but one presumes bake and clean the house and play in the vast stretches of empty spaces. Gruen saw this as a problem of society, a need for a place where people could come together and share in cultural experiences. These buildings, in Gruen's mind, would be state-owned facilities where people could come and mingle, exchange ideas. It was a blast of old-fashioned Greek democracy positioned squarely in suburban centers. So, in the 1950s, just as World War II provided another boost to the urban flight and a rush to the suburbs, Gruen began building his shopping malls. It was a dream that would become, for Gruen, a nightmare. By the time the 1960s rolled around, there were 4,500 shopping malls littering the landscape of the suburbs. Their presence on city planning, infrastructure, and the very economies of suburban communities cannot be overstated. They became cultural centers, sure, but not an exchange of ideas as Gruen hoped. They were monuments to capitalism and consumerism, a place where one could compare one's life against another's and buy all the things that would fill the gulf between the life you had and the life you wanted. In a 1986 issue of Consumer Reports, the shopping mall, as an invention, was named one of the 50 greatest consumer innovations in history, right up there with antibiotics and personal computers. In 1985, 
a law professor at the University of California in Los Angeles penned a letter attempting to sway the New York Court of Appeals to lift a ban on pamphleteering in malls. The court decided that this sort of thing was disruptive to all the shopping and buying and food courting. But this professor argued that the mall had become essentially a town square and some amount of disruption in all that shopping was important and even necessary for the betterment of democracy. Gruen would have been proud. This was what he wanted all along. The mall as city center, a place where ideas are debated and exchanged. But not everything was rosy with the advent of malls. I mean, it started as a way to subvert the feminization of suburban culture, already a fairly sexist idea. But then came the racism. Yeah, you knew that was coming. Most of the flight from urban areas to the suburbs was from your old pal, the Caucasian, a phenomenon known as white flight. So more white people than any other demographic were fleeing the city, percentage-wise. And it also helped if you could afford a car to get to said mall, which required reasonable and steady income, something white folks had more than their fair share of when compared with other groups, especially in the 50s and 60s. And the jobs opening up in the suburbs? Yep, you needed cars to get to them too. And basic access to the malls isn't the only thing that was inherently problematic when discussing race. If someone in the black or Hispanic community did manage to make it to a mall, they reported high degrees of racial profiling by mall security. 65% of black people and 56% of Hispanic people believe that they were profiled when entering stores and malls, according to a 2004 Gallup poll. And if you needed more proof, Barney's of New York and Macy's were so guilty of it, an investigation was called and both stores' locations were found to practice high degrees of racial profiling in their anti-theft practices. That could explain why, during the Black Lives Matter protests of 2015, the largest mall in the country, Bloomington, Minnesota's Mall of America, was chosen as a site of a large-scale protest, as if to say, here, in this place, we do not feel we are being respected or treated with basic human dignity. But of course, nothing can last. Malls fell victim to the one constant, change. Online shopping hit consumers and consumers loved it. All the stuff, none of the walking and shopping and shutter being around other people. You can have whatever you want dropped on your doorstep and you don't even have to look at the person who brought it to you. The final nail in Gruen's utopian ideal of the mall, get rid of all the interaction and leave behind the raw consumerism. Between 2008 and 2009, malls posted losses of 6.5% in sales. And suddenly, malls were closing, at least 15% of them. Giant edifices that once contained hundreds or thousands of people, now empty, some left abandoned so that nature herself began its reclamation of the spaces. By 2022, that number was more like 20-25% to of all malls in this country were closed. These are haunted places, these empty and abandoned malls, and a look at the internet to see some of the images is like looking at sets from some post-apocalyptic film. Before he died in 1980, Gruen said, I am often called the father of the shopping mall. I would like to take this opportunity to disclaim paternity once and for all. I refuse to pay alimony to those bastard developments. They destroyed our cities. It is perhaps fitting that in the wake of his demise, so too did the mall die. And yet, there is life in the old girl yet, or perhaps a resurrection, as befitting our Halloween season. Local communities have, in some places, bought up the old private malls and turned them into communal spaces. Places where local hospitals have satellite centers, or community colleges, or cultural centers for some of these same communities for whom the traditional mall meant profiling and disenfranchisement. There is also the rise of the mall walker, a punchline sure, but also a pretty remarkable thing. Elderly citizens who are often left behind in the need for community as friends and relatives die or lose touch or simply don't want to be around creepy old people, these elderly citizens can go to these mostly abandoned malls where there's maybe one anchor store holding on and an orange Julius, and then a whole wing devoted to a trade school or something. 
They can walk these malls with others like them, people still looking for ways to be active and to be social. Alexandra Lang, who has studied the rise and fall of the mall as an institution, says about this phenomena, quote, the mall in its quiet early hours provides affordances most cities and suburbs cannot, even open walkways, consistent weather, bathrooms, and benches. A 2010 study found, quote, spatial practice often exceeds the conceptions of designers and managers, transforming malls into community space. This is particularly true in declining inner suburbs, where poor and racialized communities depend more heavily on malls for social reproduction as well as recreation and consumption. That's just a fancy way to say that the malls have become actual places of community. Again, in keeping with our Halloween season, Gruen had to invent his monster, watch it die, and then return as the thing he intended all along. And given the cultural obsession with malls in the 1980s, it's no surprise that someone would make a horror movie set inside one. One would expect the king of B-movies, Roger Corman, to jump on such a thing. But you'd be wrong. It was his wife, Julie Corman, that hitched her wagon to the mall craze. Julie Corman had a deal with Vestron Pictures, one of the great B-movie studios of the 80s, to make a horror movie that takes place in a mall. She turned to a writer-director inside the Roger Corman stable to bring her vision to life, a guy by the name of Jim Wynorski. We talked extensively about Wynorski on the episode on Return of the Swamp Thing way back in Season 5, Episode 2, a movie Wynorski also directed. If you don't recall that one or didn't listen to that episode, first of all, shame on you. The short version is that Wynorski is a grade-A weirdo with a penchant for large breasts and making everything from cheap sci-fi movies to cheap skin flicks. He's made a career for himself, and that's something, but make no mistake, Jim Wynorski is not what you would call an auteur. Still, at the time of Choppy Mall's inception, Wynorski was a go-to guy in the Corman world, having written movies like Forbidden World and Sorceress and Screwballs, a uh, Porky's knockoff, for Corman, and he had recently written and directed the movie the Lost Empire, which IMDb describes thusly. Seeking revenge, Officer Angel Wolf, her Native American friend White Star, oh boy, and outlaw Heather infiltrate a fortified island where an undead wizard and his evil cult force captured women to take part in gladiatorial tournaments. So you kind of know what you're getting with this guy. But he did work fast and on a budget, and that goes a long way with Roger Corman. And Julie Corman pitched the concept to Wynorski, who said he could write a script on the cheap if he'd also be allowed to direct. Corman agreed, Julie that is, and Wynorski was off to the races. He enlisted the aid of a buddy, Steve Mitchell, a guy he knew from the horror convention circuit. The two bonded when they kept running into each other at conventions for EC Comics, the pre-code horror comics that are truly wonders to behold. It was Wynorski who said that they ought to do robots in a mall and went on to say he was inspired by a 1954 film called GOG, in which malfunctioning robots hunt people in an underground base where a space station is being built. Others are quick to point out that there is a made-for-TV movie from 1973 called Trapped, aka Doberman Patrol, a movie that is very similar to Choppy Mall, only substitute Doberman Pinchers for robots. Regardless of how it was inspired, Wynorski and Steve Mitchell put together a story in about 24 hours. Julie Corman dug it and passed it along to the suits at Vestron, and despite the fact that there wasn't, you know, a real script, they gave it the green light. They did write a script, believe it or not, which took another month and change to get done, and lest we forget, Jim Wynorski is kind of a creep. So when it came to casting the movie, he let his dick lead the way. Dana Kimmel, an actress known at the time for Lone Wolf McQuaid, and who would later go on to be in Friday the 13th Part 3, was originally cast as the lead, but she, quote, did not want to do anything that was sexual, and so she got bounced from the cast. Enter Kelly Maroney, who had a huge run as a young woman on Ryan's Hope, the old soap opera, and then landed the role of Cindy in Fast Times at Ridgemont High. She would be best known for cult movies like Night of the Comet, 
Chopping Mall, and Not of This Earth. Wynorski wanted to date Maroney and cast her because he wanted to get it wet, and also Maroney was, quote, game for anything. Generic white guy dudes John Terleski and Russell Todd were cast as Mike and Rick, respectively, and Tony O'Dell, a.k.a. Jimmy from Karate Kid 1 and 2, plays Ferdy, the nerdy hero of our movie. And much love, as usual, to the queen of B-movies, Barbara Crampton, who was still early in her career at this point, but not that early. She was already the woman who was eaten out by that decapitated head in Reanimator, one of the truly shocking moments in film history, and she would, of course, go on to be in movies and television until this very day. She is currently on a run of The Young and the Restless while appearing in indie movies all over the place, and is doing voice work for video games. Recently, the character of Mom in the zombie co-op shooter Back for Blood. Is there anything she can't do? Oh, and you'll probably recognize some character actors in the mix too, like Dick Miller and Paul Bartell and Mary Warrenoff, the latter couple featured in the movie Eating Raoul, a cult movie if ever there was one. And Dick Miller was not only a Roger Corman staple, he's been in pretty much every B-movie worth a damn in the past half century or more. So the movie was intended to be shot at the Beverly Center in Los Angeles, but that cost a lot of money, and this movie didn't have a lot of money. So they shot some exteriors there, and then they filmed all the interiors at the Sherman Oaks Galleria, which was also the mall used in Fast Times at Richmond High, and the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie Commando. For the furniture store, the production took over an empty space and made their own store, which doubled as storage for all the equipment during the day when the mall was open. The shooting of the movie took about 20 days, and for better or worse, Chopping Mall was ready to unleash on an unsuspecting public. Only, it wasn't called Chopping Mall at first. It was called Killbots, and it was test marketed to audiences in March of 1986. The test screenings went poorly, and the movie was, pardon the expression, chopped down and given the new title, Chopping Mall. When it finally did make its way to wide release, the movie was met with decent, if unexceptional, business and critical reviews that landed somewhere south of good. Though some critics found some fun with the film, even if they admitted that it was no cinematic achievement. But it was on home video that Chopping Mall found its audience, one that would inspire a DVD release in 2004 on the back of some really good VHS sales and rental numbers. Maybe it was the poster, maybe it was just the silliness of it all, maybe just the sun shining on this particular dog's ass on this particular day, but Chopping Mall was, after a while, a success. But does this consumer concoction have any fire in the bellies of its robotic security guards, or is this one big not topic? To find out, let's get Chad in here to ring up the damage on this Jim Wynorski Jim. Ladies and gentlemen, birdies and Susie's, it's 1986's Chopping Mall. Welcome back, everyone, to yet another episode of Pick 6 Movies. This one, not content with just referring to the 80s all the time on account of us being old. <laughs> We're <laughs> going to watch a movie set so firmly in the strata of the 1980s. It is chock full of malls and big hair and slang and crappy effects. <laughs> Brightly colored clothing and gratuitous nudity. That is both a trademark of the 1980s and our pal Jim Wynorski, who of course directed this. So Choppy Mall is a movie that I feel like has been sort of always with me in some weird way. Like, I don't think it's a great movie, and we'll talk about it's all not. the reasons why. No, it's clearly not. <laughs> but it feels like that friend you have that you don't really have that much in common with, but 
you've always been around them and so you're you just got sort some of weird place. friends man i don't know anybody like this movie oh i know a lot of people <laughs> that are like the living embodiment of chopping wall when i watched this movie it reminded me that there are certain films that were made in the 80s that really captured the essence of the 1980s like you mentioned in the intro cameron crow and amy heckerling's fast times at ridgemont high mm-hmm. i think that spike lee's do the right thing captures the 80s in a certain way all the john hughes films you know just across the board but i also think that those movies are separate from movies that were made in the 80s that define that generation of filmmaking like rambo or the indiana jones films fall into that ghostbusters and terminator and back to the future and all of the unlimited slasher movies that were cranked out during that particular decade Mm -hmm. you know i just think that certain movies were able to just capture the essence of that decade without trying to re recreate a certain moment and i think that chopping mall may be one of the most fantastic time capsules for the 1980s ever captured on film because it's got so much of the mall culture and it's got a slasher film component to it and it's this techno disaster type nightmare it feels like the 1980s just shit out of film it has all the trappings of the 1980s it's not trying to be a time capsule which kind of makes it a better time capsule it's the opposite of wonder woman 1984 that's a great example and a horrible movie i would rather watch (laughs) chopping mall than wonder woman 84 it's more authentic and genuine and it's shorter and it's more entertaining and if you like it there's a lot more nudity both male and female this is true say what you will about chopping mall it is fairly equal opportunity i mean it's certainly more exploitative with the women i guess but you see as many male nipples as female nipples this is nipples true. Nipples a nipple. I guess that's right. When was the first time you saw this movie? Three days ago. Oh, really? You had never seen this before? No, this one never came across my radar. It always just looked a little too bad, and I don't know why. I mean, I'm surprised that you and I never watched this together, but I'd never seen it. For those who don't know, there were certain people in the 1980s, children, mm-hmm. who were just like left to their own devices and just figured things out, and there wasn't a whole hell of a lot to do, Like, and going to the mall was one of them. T- TV only had three stations. They all showed the same thing. News, game shows, soap operas, syndicated garbage in the afternoon, local Mm -hmm. news, and then three hours of programming. And that that was it. Yeah. You had one station of PBS that showed you stuff to learn from. And then you had one wild card of a UHF station, if you were lucky. And that just showed a bunch of public domain cartoons and public domain movies and cheap pay-to-play trash. Mm -hmm. Like, there was nothing to do but get in trouble, watch that crappy TV, or go to the mall. And that's assuming you had a car to get to them all otherwise you're just roaming the neighborhood completely unsupervised with a, a stick and ill intent and if it was near new year's day or fourth of july you were blowing things up with fireworks boy those were the days well there were also maybe one or two movie theaters in town this is how bad it was but remember when they turned that 7-eleven into a video rental store oh sure it, yeah, it yeah, went yeah. tits up i'm in that video rental store and i'm standing there looking at the movies to rent and the movie mannequin it's on the shelf and i'm thinking about watching mannequin mm-hmm. and i pick it up and then i turn around and i look over at the the marquee for the shitty movie theater in our hometown and they're showing the movie mannequin now this was not one of those like late to the game dollar theaters this was full price movie theater Uh huh. and they had eight screens at the time like they'd built that out but i was like how in the hell is there a vhs copy of mannequin available for it and they are still showing this movie on the big screen probably wasn't legally obtained is what i would uh w- would suggest i don't know that was what the shitty cam version of mannequin I, my point here just being is that movies during this era i don't know that i have a point here mm-hmm. yeah I, I don't think i do oh okay when was the last time you went to a shopping mall let's talk about that for a moment i walked into a shopping mall within the past two years it's been a decade since i've walked into a shopping mall proper the only reason reason i did is because the child i was with uh legally Uh legally was taking you to the cops or (laughs) no no (laughs) wanted to get some chinese from the food court oh and so we were going to that but we walked into the mall and she said i don't like this place and i said (laughs) i don't either and then we turned around and left so i was in the mall once in the past decade for about 38 seconds (laughs) 
And that was it. I go to one of those outdoor shopping epicenters, kind of have like a Lowe's and a Target, and then Mm -hmm. everything else is just stitched together. It's it's not encased in a giant building. But back in the day, going to the mall was a thing to do. Again, this is before the internet when you could just, you know, look at all the porn you wanted. Wait, 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 wait. There's what on the what now? (laughs) Oh, boy. I'll tell you what. Let's take this offline, but I've got (laughs) something I think you're really going to like. Yeah, I mean, you could walk in the place with 20 bucks, hit the food court, maybe buy a cassette tape, or go to the movie, which was attached to the mall. And all of that for a relatively inexpensive amount of money, and that blew your afternoon. And you had nothing but time. You had no sense of mortality or how quick all this goes by. So you just blew time hanging out, watching people go by and sipping an oversized Orange Julius. In a lot of ways, it was kind of wonderful, and in a lot of ways, is it? it's very sad let's talk about this movie oh yeah please out of the gate bow i awarded this movie one very enthusiastic star for its opening credits of which there are none mm-hmm. kudos to you chopping ball the movie we go right into a dude breaking the window of a jewelry store but it's a fake opening like a james bond or indiana jones or something but i was like hey they're getting into the movie that's fine those are real things that happen this is just a movie made by the security company but it's this thief swiping a bunch of jewels yeah he's a burglar he's wearing (laughs) a little black hoodie i wish his shirt would have been white and black stripe but then that would imply that he got busted by the cops or a bandit mask that would have been good one of those that ties at the back of his head that would have been pretty good and this jewelry he's stealing it's clearly costume jewelry that cost like 18 bucks retail the dude would have made more money by carefully cutting out the window pane of glass that he smashed and selling that on the streets i buy most of my glass just i've got a guy let's just say that sure everybody's got a glass guy why would you pay retail for that that's just foolish it's a fine question i've never done it hey you need glass i got glass do you think they have have the overcoats like yeah like what do you mm-hmm. want do you want you want some stained glass mm-hmm. i've got plexiglass i've got security Smoke, glass opaque. what yeah. do you need buddy huh <laughs> my you live glass in a, guy you live in a hurricane zone i got that covered see that right there that's a federal tax stamp it doesn't get more legal than that so back to our movie yeah yeah our, our bandit's stealing this jewelry right and then a four foot tall kill bot on treads rolls up behind this bandit and says stop right there and surrender your weapon and this kill bot clearly looks inspired by short circuits johnny five and our own heartbeats crime buster only 80 percent cheaper and about yeah 60 percent smaller this bandit turns around bow and starts firing his pistol at the kill bot left and right he just empties his chamber and then he's like yeah and he runs off and the kill bot gives chase and then fires a, a taser mm-hmm. into the back of this bandit rendering the bandit unconscious and then the end flashes on the screen i was like wow this is gonna be the shortest episode we've ever done it was awesome wasn't it you're like <laughs> is that it and they're like oh crap this is just a head fake and i like that it's listed as a secure tronics production uh like like wait what are we doing here and then it cuts to this reel-to-reel projector showing that this is a short movie about a mall robbery at night and it's being shown to a small audience of people in folding chairs sitting in a real mall at night it's real meta indeed i think if i was the head of secure tronics i would have had some real life bandits go rob these people's stores during the mall presentation and then when they went back to work they were just like we were robbed we need kill bots to protect our crummy merchandise that guy was right you know secure tronics is one of the unsung heroes of filmmaking of this era not only did they do obviously the kill bot safety video Mm -hmm. they also did breaking away the bicycling epic and did they really yeah they did the original karate kid those were both secure tronics films but then they went under just you know bad deals this blonde woman wearing a very smart looking suit and glasses she takes the stage and she says ladies and gentlemen that ends our fake out intro to the movie here is the head of development for secure tronics unlimited incorporated international a division of globocom and its parent company omega corp mr dr stan simon oh by the way chad Mm -hmm. worth pointing out we've got our cameo here by paul bartell and mary warrenoff oh they're showing up they're gonna be here another cameo the woman making the announcement is angela ames who had some small parts on cheers and night court but she was the woman who was getting her baby's 
photos made at the opening of Bachelor Party when Adrian Smed and Tom Hanks come in and they do that impromptu photo shoot with their head all around her large cleavage. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's her. Oh, you think wow. Bachelor Party holds up pretty well? Oh, almost certainly not, Chad. <laughs> Everything I remember about it is problematic at best. <laughs> Guy putting his wiener in the hot dog bun and that old lady yanking on it. I'm just thinking of the list of shit that they tout as being acceptable yeah an appeal for the party itself yeah none of that is okay i want to say though whenever i use paprika in the kitchen the words thank you thank you you made me the happiest spice in the whole world <laughs> always comes out of my mouth. i have the same problem i do the exact same thing <laughs> it's paprika so dr stan simon he comes up on stage and he says hello people of the mall uh, full disclosure the doctor in my name is followed by a question mark and legally must be pronounced <laughs> doctor Doctor Stan Simon. <laughs> and yes, that's my Christian name. My parents were high on PCP when they named me. Let me introduce you to your new security team, the Protector 101 Killbot Series 2000. And then there's these three killbots behind him sitting on the stage and that's the point where paul bartell is like they look like the three stooges and then he says uh -huh. i don't know that one in the middle has an unpleasant ethnic quality which is the one genuine laugh of the movie for me i couldn't tell if this movie was self-aware or just terrible and after watching it twice bo i'm still not sure but i think it's just terrible Paul Bartell and Mary Warrenoff wrote their own dialogue for this movie. That doesn't mean it's not racist. They're both satirists to one degree or another, and they're kind of reprising the roles from Eating Raul, and those characters are very aristocratic, racist, close-minded kinds of characters. So I think it's just in keeping with that character. I don't think Paul Bartell actually believes that, you know, <laughs> that robot had an unpleasant uh, ethnic quality. I think he was just goofing. I don't think that's directly racist, but also all these people are dead and there's no way to know. Dr. Stan Simon stands up and says, so are there any questions? And this one dude stands up and he says, uh, yes, what do your machines do besides kill people? I was like, kill people? <laughs> what are they, judge, jury, and executioner for some handsy kids at a Spencer's gift? Buh, 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 buh. Let me just stop you right there. They don't kill. They just incapacitate. They fire sleep darts or something. They've got sleep darts. They've got the tasers. They've got laser beams that shoot out of their faces. Once they identify a suspect, they alert the police. Plus, getting into the mall now is almost impossible because we have steel doors that lock from mid midnight till dawn come to think of it the killbots are unnecessary since we have those no steel doors forget that last thing i just said you're gonna want the killbots you can't get the steel doors without the killbots it's a package deal people that's how it works you're buying the killbots the, the steel doors come with the killbots you can't get the doors and no killbot that's the icing on the cake is paul the and mary the satirist from the racist side of town he leans in he's like maybe we could use one at the restaurant get rid of the people we don't like and i'm like oh, based on that ethnic quality comment earlier i know what kind of people you're talking about another guy in the crowd's like how are they gonna tell who's a good guy and who's a bad guy over here and then dr stan smith says i'm so glad you asked total stranger who i've never met before wink wink all employees have to do is show their name badge and they won't be shot with sleep darts or confused as mall debris or electrocuted and then Dr. Stan Smith <laughs> calls the Killbot control room and he says, bring Killbot number one online. And Killbot number one comes online and scans Dr. Stan Smith's badge. And it says, thank you. Have a nice day. And then the guy in the audience goes, yeah, follow up question. Well, what if the bad guys get another employee's badge? I mean, couldn't they just run around causing all kinds of crimes and then just flash somebody else's badge? Unfortunately, I'm not taking any more questions. Don't worry. Nothing could possibly go wrong. Possibly. Right. That's the first thing that's ever gotten wrong. And then we get the movie's title, Chopping Mall. Mm -hmm. And we get this montage of vintage 80s mall culture with the opening credits, which is arguably a waste of time, but it does help to establish the footprint of where this movie is taking place. So, Counselor, I will allow it. And he gives us a little entertainment along the way, because we start off, we see a kid go into an elevator, he's eating a big ice cream cone, and then a bunch of adults rush in, and the doors close, and they open, and the kid's covered with chocolate ice cream all over his face and 
shirt. How or why did that happen? I have no idea. That's a pretty good gag. We see a couple of kids making out on a bench and this old couple see them and they're like, I'll have some of that. And they start making out a little bit. Let's clarify old couple. These people are in their 80s. They're of the koala chlamydia age where they are in some kind of assisted living facility that is just running wild with syphilis right now they're doing a little like teeth swapping yeah it's sexy (laughs) we see a guy stealing about 50 lps those are large record albums for our younger listeners Mm. and they're stuffed up under his shirt it's obvious that he's stealing these and he's wearing a button-up shirt and i'm like this is a rookie mistake yeah that's not great honestly when cds first came out and they put them in the long sleeves Mm -hmm. that was a real anti-theft deterrent i mean for some people chad our friend ben who's probably stolen more things than anybody i've ever known in my lifetime Uh uh-huh two things he stole that i was always impressed with one was he went into a store that was called tg and y it was a precursor to walmart like a local five and dime chain he and another guy went into this uh, TGNY, went back to the sporting goods store, and just picked up a canoe and walked out with it. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is impressive. Thinking, no one's going to stop me if I walk out with a canoe. They're going to think I paid for it. And, and he they was were right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he lived probably close to a mile, and they carried it back to his house. Another fun fact, he lived nowhere near a body of water. But he had a canoe. He also stole full body cow costume from a coach house gifts in mm-hmm. a shopping mall by stuffing it down his pants, which is impressive. And then he proceeded to put on that cow costume, wear it to a high school football game and jump down on the field. And what the write up report said from the vice principal was that he was uh, down on the field simulating masturbation with cow udders. Yeah, How do you not? I don't know. When, when you're milking yourself in a cow I, outfit. Look, I pose that question to you. How do you not seem like you're masturbating? Any lawyer worth a nickel can say, do you know what masturbation is? Yes. These are udders. This isn't masturbation. Sure, they look similar, but sir, you need to go spend a little bit of time with 4-H. Can you milk an udder and a penis? Yes. The answer to that is clearly yes. But just because (laughs) the motions are the same does not mean they achieve the same level of inappropriateness. Or even satisfaction. You'll have to go ask the cow and the bull to get that answered. During this montage in the mall, we do see a kid in a video game arcade arcade playing and then this guy rolls up who's clearly a pedophile so the kid leaves and then the pervert takes over playing the kid's game which wasn't that an awesome opportunity when you were in an arcade and then some kid's mom comes up you know billy we gotta go and then billy leaves and you take over or a pedophile rolls up and scares the kid away sure. yeah but you get that free yeah play. that was the best yeah. man like hey you want to take over my yeah. game hell yeah i will you just save me 25 cents buddy also there's a gag where a woman is navigating the crowd at the food court with this tray of food yeah How's that going to ambo? Oh, not good, Chad. We see a, a guy holding a bunch of boxes. He dumps them on the escalator when he sees some b- 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 babes uh, <laughs> with sashes and bathing suits coming down the other side. Hey, you want to be in a movie? <laughs> you got a bikini? <laughs> Oh, ho, ho. you got high heels? Hey, tell me more. Put on this sash. You're going to be in the movie, all right? You know how to milk a cow? You know how to milk a bull? <laughs> As we've discussed twice now on this show, Jim Wynorski is a great A creep. Yeah. And I am sure that your impression of this is far closer to the truth than either of us would care to. Yeah, and I just want to go on record and say, I was shocked at how reserved this movie was with its creepiness. Although, no, we'll get into it in a minute, but the majority of the nudity takes place in one of the most strange environments with all types of comings and goings going on, pun intended. There's a real, like, polyamorous vibe to a lot of this. (laughs) So the, the woman navigating the tray of food, like, this whole bit ends with her just getting to the table and then totally whiffing it and dumping the food all over somebody else at the it's table. a real tin chocolate cream pies <laughs> if you get that reference you're old as a wise man once said there are as yet undiscovered tribes in the amazon who could see that <laughs> joke coming <laughs> We get to a restaurant in the food court where all of the walls are covered in cross promotion of other terrible slasher and sci-fi films. One assumes that were produced by Roger Corman or members of his family. And here we meet two of our movie's four female characters, Allison and Susie. They are working as waitresses in this restaurant. Allison is our movie's final girl. And Susie, we're just going to call her the waitress to keep all of this straight until they one by one get killed. Mm -hmm. I like how they're shouting out all that make them up diner speak to this fat chef who's working in an open kitchen 
attention. He looks like if Chef Boyardee's life went terribly wrong in every way. He's openly smoking and he's wearing this t-shirt that looks like a used diaper. It's just smeared with shit. This was at a time when a short order cook was expected to be smoking as he cooked. And looked disgusting and unshaven and... It is the culinary embodiment of the line, uh, you can barely see them nipples. Yeah. Like, if you could take that line and shove it into a cook's outfit. It's this It's guy. this yeah. human being. Allison drops a plate. This gives both she and Susie a chance to bend over and give us a little exposition as they're cleaning up the mess. And Susie says, tonight's the night. You got to come to this party. I set you up this really cute guy. And then Chef Boyard DUI shouts out, hey, <laughs> uh, come on, uh, take it to food. The while it's so hot. Uh, I'm going to go take it a break and do the, the drugs and the walk in a cooler. Which he does have a terrible Italian accent, which was surprising. And so Susie, by the way, is warning Allison about this fat customer that likes to get handsy. Yeah. And the way she puts it is, yeah, that orca beaches here every week. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, wow. That <laughs> is really rough. The scene does end with him shouting out, more butter. Poor Allison ends up dropping a dish and that's where Susie is like, ah, forget what Chef Boyard DUI has to say. <laughs> you should come to this party that we're going to have. We'll get to that. The movie cuts to Killbot Control Room, where some technician is just hanging out and then the movie cuts to the city skyline where bolts of lightning are striking earth with such force and frequency i thought we were on some planet from the dune series and then <laughs> one of the bolts i mean it's like kapow kapow one bolt strikes the mall and like frankenstein our monsters come to life but in this movie the monsters are the killbots and they directly mm-hmm. bypass that stage of benevolent kindness and they just go straight to murdering rampage <laughs> as part of this particular narrative this is a storm equivalent to the one that sets off the horrible fine chain of events in the movie poltergeist it is lightning and wind everything is going wrong also the nerd here watching over the killbots when the lightning hits also smoking yeah because it was the 80s and that's what you did in every movie and you looked at pornography because he's looking at a playboy or penthouse or something and unfolding it and he's giving it a va 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 voom and then one of the killbots just comes over and using its pincher claw kills this nerd technician it just goes right right through the centerfold and grabs the guy by the throat no, question mark when he falls down he's got a bloody neck but it's real unclear as to how this particular murder happens i love how this movie doesn't give any real reason as to why any of this is happening i mean it's in, like in short <laughs> yeah. circuit the robots got electrocuted and that's what brings them to life this just jumps from a to z so fast like there's never a moment of well you know sir if the killbots were to get a surge of electricity it could potentially cause problems with their safety software like none of that like you're in a movie called chopping mall what do you think these idiots want to see no bullshit cut the credits <laughs> and even the nerdlinger we'll get to in a little bit ferdy his character should be the one that's like oh i think i see what happened that lightning (laughs) hit the antenna no 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 none none of that like you said we're not fucking around here the movie's called chopping mall let's get to some chopping chop chop so we cut to our three male leads in this movie who work in a store that's called furniture king and they sell housewares Mm -hmm. and as the name implies furniture's a bunch of couches and lamps and tvs and whatever the film crew could scrounge up from the local goodwill store and (laughs) yeah no this is a real goodwill kind of put together situation there's mike who's the dude douchebag of the bunch Mm -hmm. and then there's greg i'm gonna call him the sensible one and then there's ferdy who's the nerdy one that's easy to remember because ferdy rhymes with nerdy and Mm -hmm. and every male in this movie has a female counterpart so greg the sensible one he's paired with Susie, the waitress from earlier mike the douchebag is paired with leslie the sexy one and i'm using that term loosely and then ferdy gets paired with allison our final girl and then later we're going to meet rick and linda now none of that matters but we are going to try to keep it all straight the killbots one by one murder these people they're giving ferdy a little bit of grief just because he's a nerdlinger and they're like hey we got some beer for the party but we need a place to have it and ferdy our nerd because of you know nerdy is like geez guys i don't know if we should host the party in my store over here because hey this is my uncle's store and i'm up for a big promotion maybe but ferdy doesn't even look like a nerd he's a handsome dude who's just wearing glasses and he's not terribly tall but there's nothing about him that like you didn't have some white tape that you could stick in the middle of his glasses how is that not there more than that chad it's that we're gonna take off the glasses and suddenly we're dealing with a hunk and or mm-hmm. babe and it's that in space like 
like Ferdy is the most competent put together person in the entire film and is treated like he is the biggest doofus but that's also a very 80s kind of trope but they don't do it well here well no well (laughs) i mean you show me anything that's done well in this movie mike the douchebag says the fridge is full of beer rick and linda bringing the food and we've got clean sheets and i was like clean sheets what's gonna ew Mm -hmm. oh god so then the movie cuts to our fourth couple the aforementioned rick and linda they are in a truck and the truck's on the side of the road having car trouble and they're on the way to the mall for this party Bo. and this Mm -hmm. feels like a scene from what i would classify as a in the woods camping horror film but we're not we're in this urban california shopping techno horror film because here arguably you're setting up why the truck won't start later in our movie it's had a little trouble here it won't turn over later but here none of this matters it doesn't matter that they're in the truck doesn't matter that it won't turn over none of that just have them show up at the mall there is so much unnecessary backstory in this scene not only do we get the fact that the truck is hard to start we get the fact that linda is the one who fixes it because because she's the really good don't mechanic. matter later at all right they're married but they have all this money sunk in the new business r and l automotive and the r and l are in a heart that's because they're in it the also house. don't matter no the guy is kind of reluctant to go but then linda shows him a little lingerie that she was like well i guess i won't have anywhere to wear this his eyes bug out like a cartoon wolf yeah. and he puts the pedal to the metal to get to the shopping mall mm-hmm. but all of this stuff is completely unnecessary to the film yeah just have them show up at the mall yeah and one wonders if there is not some version where the fact that she's a good mechanic and he's not somehow it has something to do with something when it comes to this movie but it never materializes it's a real checkoffs mechanic that doesn't ever go off i guess so mike the douchebag goes into a women's clothing store to check in with leslie the sexy one and he sneaks up behind her and just grabs her breast with both hands oh sure classy typical mike yeah. the douchebag and then mike says hey i can't wait for the night and then these two just start violently making out in the store she is an employee of this place and she's just sticking her tongue down the throat of this guy not just an employee the employee of her father who may question mark owned this clothing <laughs> store because he just comes out and is like <clears throat> yeah how about little... you leave a little room for the holy ghost uh-huh. there would you mind removing your hand from the front of my daughter's Calvin Klein dungarees? Sorry, Dad. I was just excited because we're going to Susie's birthday party. Very good. Lock up and I'll keep an eye on this riffraff. Allison's dad is on the phone with her at the mall. And why she has to call her dad to say, hey, I'm thinking of going to this party being held here at the mall for some reason. I thought all of these people are in their mid to late 20s. Oh, absolutely. Everybody in this movie absolutely looks like they are old enough to drive, vote, and be drafted. (laughs) Rent a car. Possibly adopt (laughs) it. another person in fact for a while there i thought Susie had adopted allison (laughs) well she gets off the phone with her dad and she's like i love you daddy and then the movie pans out and we see that allison and Susie are in a locker room where they're changing clothes and it also appears Mm -hmm. that there are showers for the mall employees to use but i worked in a couple of malls earlier (laughs) in my life this is a hundred percent made up this does not exist in the real world of Eh, maybe it's a fancy california mall chat i don't think so i think that the director director was like hey, 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 anybody want to maybe be in a movie take your top off walk around over here we're in the shower scene at the mall. are you sure i have to do yeah, this Mr. yeah yeah you know the, hey you know how to milk a cow you know how to milk a bull huh <laughs> you like to ride escalators huh hey, hey, hey you like to ride anything else where are you going hey come back here sweet cheeks Allison tells Susie, hey, I'm going to go to this party. Of course, Susie is very excited by this. On their way out, Susie borrows a bunch of hairspray and makeup. Then they head back inside the store because they're going to the furniture store in the mall. I'm like, why go out in the first place? (laughs) We hear over the loudspeaker, the mall will be closing in 10 minutes. And then outside, there's more lightning strikes. Back inside at the Killbot Observatorium, the night shift technician shows up to take over for that guy who likes spank books and is now dead by the way what did the daytime tech do because the killbots don't work during the day labor ain't cheap bo fire that guy increase your margins killbot incorporated he's just there to make sure that lightning doesn't hit the panel yes so Uh oh the new guy comes in and the day shift guy isn't there and the night tech is played by actor garrett graham who i know as the guy that was terrified of red cars in the kurt russell movie used cars written and directed by robert zemeckis and co-authored by bob gale the two people who brought us 
Back to the Future. That's a pretty good movie. Mm -hmm. You've never seen it. I mean, it ain't great, but it's pretty funny. You can see hints of Back to the Future in the finale of that. Like the race against time and how it all comes together. I was like, mm, I can see how they built on this a little bit. This same actor is also the titular Bud in Chud 2, Bud the Chud. He was the voice of Jay Sherman's nutty adoptive father on the animated series The Critic. Oh, that's pretty he did good. a bunch of voice work. He didn't just disappear into drugs and alcohol and bull milk. Not like I'm planning to. <laughs> this other tech comes in and first tech's nowhere to be seen. Did the Killbots just clean up all of their carnage and porn? Again, it's like the player character in the game Hitman just dumping a body in the nearest I, dumpster. I'm like, there's going to be a lot of blood, but maybe not. Well, they have a vacuum attachment where they're... <laughs> Tech number two sits down and starts reading a book that appears not to be pornography. The book's title is It Came From Outer Space, which now that I think about it, that could be erotic fiction. <laughs> I guess it could be now that you, <laughs> you say it like that. Wouldn't that be It Came In Outer Space? Or on Outer Space or with Outer Space? Yeah. There's a whole series in the It Came series, Bo. Is there a box set I can buy so I could just read it cover to there cover? There is, but if you're going to get it, get the illustrated version. Worth every penny. They come pre-stuck together. And with 3D glasses. Oh, that is handy. <laughs> so he hears the robots power up and it does a real like psych out where he looks over. He's like, huh? And they're all powered down. Uh, dum, dum, and then dum, he looks back and then you mm -hmm. yeah. And then the pincher comes out again and the phone rings and the door closes. And then finally the killbot fires this like hook into the back of this dude's neck. And down goes Garrett Graham. R.I.P. Yeah, yeah. So long, Bud the Chud. We cut to the party over at Furniture King. This whole place is about the size of a high school classroom. And all four <laughs> of our couples are just drinking Paps Blue Ribbon out of the can like you do. There's a bunch of white guy dancing going on to the song Street Walking by Sylvia St. James. The title music track to the movie Street Walking about Times Square hookers that came out in 1985. And I thought, are the four people in this movie just jamming out to the soundtrack of street walking a good song is a good song it doesn't matter where it came from <laughs> if you could dance to it it works yeah yeah like judgment night isn't a great movie but the song judgment night is fantastic birdies in the bathroom of this furniture store trying to look less nerdy or less handsome i couldn't tell he gives a breath check in the palm like <sighs> and then he gives a little couple of banaka blasts to make his mouth ever fresh then he heads out to find three of the four couples drinking and making out and then Ferdy gets thrust into the arms of Allison, our final girl. And it's one of those, why do birds suddenly <laughs> appear every time you are near? And they're just, they're looking at each other like, I'm in love. Yeah, wide-eyed and everything. And meanwhile, back in the store proper, they turn around and Greg and Susie are totally making out in front of God and everybody. I am not a public display of affection kind of person as a mm -hmm. rule and certainly not to this degree. <laughs> you know what buckle up it's gonna be a bumpy ride we cut to the <laughs> outside of the mall and the killbots are just patrolling around the mall is now closed and over at furniture king this party's really going strong and killbot number one drives by but doesn't do anything and then killbot number two comes online and starts to patrol its level of the mall and then all the killbots are out and they're rolling around in the mall which by the way this mall has carpet gross imagine how disgusting that is one of the reasons they have the killbot, because as we saw with all the blood in the office, mm -hmm. they're also constantly vacuuming. They're like the proto Roomba. They're just Roombas with a uh, homicidal intent. Hold on. Invention idea. Tie a gun to the top of your Roomba to protect your house and keep it clean. All right. Um, Quick note. Make movie called Roombicide. <laughs> Terma Roomba? Mm, no. The Roomba Nader? No. Uh. The Roomba with a view? That's the more romantic one. Roomba Cop? Roomba Cop is not bad. <laughs> Hey, sleaze bag. Roombo. <laughs> hey, sleaze bag. I'm stuck on this small wooden ledge separating the hallway from the bathroom. How about you give a Roomba a hand, will ya? <laughs> Can you fly, Roomba? 
We come back to Furniture King and things have escalated quickly because Rick, you know, one of the two married people, he's presumably just naked in a bed bow that is for sale to people in this very tiny furniture store. <laughs> and his wife, Linda, she sashays out wearing her panties and bra combo. Keep in mind, this furniture store doesn't have separate room. It's just one big room with furniture in it and the size of a 7-Eleven. And then Linda comes out, she leaps onto Rick and then the, these two start grinding. The camera just slowly pans over and here are Greg and Susie who are on a couch that's just right over there, Bo. It's right there. Reach out your fingers you can touch. Greg says, hey, you smell like pepperoni. She's like, mm, why would you say that? And he's like, don't worry. I like pepperoni. Let's get naked and have sex on this couch that someone might buy tomorrow while our friends have sex over there on that bed that someone also might buy tomorrow one of the weirdest moments in a movie filled with a lot of weird little moments is as Susie is stripping she starts humming some inappropriately peppy tune mm -hmm. as she is stripping i think she's humming street walking street walking <laughs> Sure, probably so. You gotta be a hole in the street, street walking. Then the camera keeps panning, Yes, Chad. let's keep going. What else is happening? And now Mike and Leslie are also on a nearby couch with a sheet thrown over them, and they're getting into some uncomfortably close fucking. As the camera pans over, it goes past a box of better cheddar snack crackers. Mm. I was like, do they still make better cheddar snack crackers? Because our house is a Cheez-Its household. We also certainly uh, participate take of goldfish brand cheddar crackers as well but not so much the better cheddar crackers oh look who's <laughs> fancy why we have goldfish in our house we don't know anything about better cheddar what does that say about me we're panning across these three couples in various states of dress and <laughs> sex and i'm like hey is that better cheddar crackers do they still make those hold on let me get on the internet <laughs> well they do <laughs> have i just not been looking oh my god note to sell buy better cheddar crackers yeah sure that camera is uncomfortably close to her <laughs> nipples but i've got important information to sort out here which is can i and more to the point should i invest some time and money into getting some better cheddars in my mouth is that a can of melon flavored hawaiian punch in the background i believe it do they make that they do, but you have to buy it direct from the manufacturer. Oh my god, that's a 64-ounce bottle of Ecto Cooler. <laughs> Hang on a second. <laughs> ah, oh wait, you can make your own? <laughs> Guess who's having better cheddars than Ecto Cooler this weekend? <laughs> so, the movie eventually pans over to Ferdy the Nerdy and Allison, our final girl, and they're innocently watching the 1965 black and white movie Attack of the Crab Monster which may or may not be an intentional choice as our three killbots also have pinchers on their hands like crabs. Chad, let me just say, here is why it's an appropriate choice. <laughs> Roger Corman owned it and it was free to put it in the movie. I was just trying to give credit where credit wasn't due. In this movie, something scary happens and it causes Allison to jump into the arms of Ferdy because she needs a big strong man to protect her. And in the background, you see a socially distant orgy taking place. These three other couples <laughs> yes. are full on having sex in the background yes, absolutely like, just think about how uncomfortable it is to be in the real world around people making out you know like at a party or if you're in a movie theater like you've been somewhere and you see like this is awkward imagine that times three and they're having sex like that's insane i would be slowly pulling the sheet back to reveal <laughs> them in totem just to get a, a look like hey if you're gonna be fucking around me i want to see the full deal. i'm leaving i'm like i'm out of here i don't want the smells to start to mix i might throw up <laughs> i've got my camera out <laughs> my phone is recording this i'm arranging lights around them i'm gonna turn this into a real like only fans kind of situation <laughs> Ferdy offers Allison some wine and she's like, Ferdy, are you trying to get me drunk? And Ferdy's like, uh, no, I just thought that a nice girl like you might be thirsty. You know, this is my uncle's furniture store and, you know, Greg set me up with you and, you know, I wouldn't tell about this sex orgy going on <laughs> to anybody because I didn't anticipate he'd set me up with someone as pretty as you. Please don't tell my uncle an orgy happened in this building. And then in the background, one of these women just starts having a very loud orgasm. Sure, like you do. I guess. Or maybe it was one of the guys who just really gets high pitched whenever someone milks the bull 
Then Ferdy says, uh, hey, Allison, uh, maybe I should take you home. The mall's security gates are going to be closing in about an hour. And then the film cuts to the TV screen where we see the finale of Attack of the Crab Monster and the words, the end, making it the second time in this film that the filmmakers gave us, the viewing audience, an out to turn off this movie or leave the theater and go about our more productive lives. But we didn't. No. And then we cut over, Chad, to legendary B-movie staple Dick Miller. He was in Heartbeeps. This is a Heartbeeps reunion, Bo. <laughs> it kind of is. You're right. <laughs> we got Crime Buster Jr. And we got those racist weirdos that threw a house party in Heartbeeps. And we got mm -hmm. Dick Miller. I, it's practically Heartbeeps, too. And honestly, 100% more entertaining. <laughs> it's a prequel to Heartbeeps. This is how th that couple rose to prominence and got that fancy house. That's and right. And it's also how they recognized the robots. That's it. Dick Miller's he's a janitor in this. And he's mopping the floor of the mall with a liquid that appears Appears to be spoiled chocolate milk. <laughs> yes. Uh, some other janitors roll up on him and they give him some shit. They're about drinking, Bo. They're well, drinking beers walking around the mall. I was like, is that what happens when the mall closed? Then what happened when I worked at the mall? Just people are having orgies in the furniture store and the janitors walk around. Mall janitors drunk. are their own breed, man. They are the greasers of the mall. Just living on by their own rules. One time. I was uh, hanging uh, out. Uh, you might have been part of this. I was hanging out with you or our friend Ben, the one who stole stuff all the time. Somewhere. I don't know where these came from, but somebody had a handful of pornographic magazines. Mm -hmm. And we're like 16, 17. I was like, what can we do with these? It'd be pretty entertaining. So we tore out the centerfolds from them and we went to the mall. I, I tell this story because I feel sorry for the janitors who had to take care of what's going to happen. And we went into the public bathrooms and we took the centerfolds and we creased them up the middle and set them up on the back of the toilet were you part of this i don't shenanigan? think so and we set him up on the back of the toilet but before we did all of that we went into the makeup section of a larger department store and we filled up our hands with white lotion mm -hmm. and took it all in and then we proceeded to just spider web this white lotion all over these centerfolds in the toilets <laughs> propped up and then left and just laughed our Which asses Which is funny off. because, <laughs> like, lotion really looks nothing like cum. Oh my god. Maybe you're doing it wrong. I don't know. It's more red because of the blood. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> it's pink <laughs> right it's got a kind of a pinkish frothy quality mm -hmm. and then and you know what happened the very next day when i looked at the headline of the local newspaper in our hometown it read uh -huh. bull milkers strike again at local mall oh bull milkers terrorizing society for the past 40 years the janitors are giving some shit about getting locked in the mall overnight at one point or something yeah it, again it's like this tease of a backstory that is unnecessary and not filled <laughs> in enough so you're just left wondering like so what happened to dick miller again? he got locked in the mall and they had to let him out the next day or something i don't know there's a whole movie that we just don't ever see about this. It's like Home Alone, just less entertaining. It's the draft script of career opportunities involving Dick Miller running around a mall screaming, Hello? Can you get me out of here? I don't have my medication. Or the first draft of Die Hard. <laughs> like, we have no idea. It could have been anything. And he says, yeah, I'll be out of here in 10 minutes. Don't you worry about it. And they're trucking off and he's just seething and muttering to himself. <laughs> as I assume Dick Miller did a lot in real and life. And then a Killbot rolls up, knocks over the mop and bucket full of thick brown liquid. And the Killbot says, may I see your identification badge, please? I'm like, oh, such polite Killbot butts your parents would be so proud and then dick miller before he can show his badge the robot fires a wire into the mop water and then it electrocutes dick miller to death at first it just knocks the bucket over no he bumps he, the robot bumps into the bucket and then it fires the right. electrodes right so it kind of sets up uh, the, the whole thing but before it fires the electrode dick miller is giving it some shit for like oh you knocked over that bucket stupid robot can't do nothing and then it fires the thing and <laughs> just zaps him and he collapses like smoke curling out of his mouth yeah. which leads to a visual gag of leslie back in the furniture fuck store saying boy i sure could use a smoke mm -hmm. 
I guess. I didn't catch that either time I watched this, but I'm proud of myself for saying that. Mike the douchebag is then sent down to go buy her some cigarettes from the vending machine. But before he leaves, Leslie says, oh, Mike, hurry back. And she pulls the covers down, exposing her breast, which, by the way, during this whole scene, Mike the douchebag was topless as well. As I mentioned earlier, this is a lot of nipples in this movie. You know, I feel like they just got done fucking and her just showing a breast is it the inspiration that i think she thinks it is nah. I think he left because he didn't want to sit there and listen to her yap. Well, and he tells her, like, hey, there's a pack of camels by the register. And she's like, you know, I only smoke virgin lights. He's like, ah, Christ. All right. So he grabs his badge just in case he runs into a kill pod. <laughs> <laughs> and he finds the cigarette machine, which, by the way, a buck twenty five for a pack of smokes in 1986, Chad. That an eight year old could purchase. That a five year old could purchase. Yeah. Nobody was looking. Nobody yeah. cared. Oh, those were the days, Dude, man. I found a pack of candy cigarettes in a store not too long ago. I bought them and gave them to my kid. I was like, smoke up, John. He was like, I'm not eating this garbage. <laughs> this looks terrible. Well, how about these? It's real cigarettes. Try he that. Goes, he's by the cigarette machine. And then a payphone behind him rings. And Mike answers it. And he says, no, Jamal, there are no messages for you. And he hangs up. And all I could think was, what was the other part of this conversation? Hi, this is Jamal. Are there any messages for me? Oh, thanks click to another movie that is happening outside the borders of the movie we're watching that i am kind of curious about the dick miller movie whatever's going on with killbot control room like a real rosencrantz and gildenstern like it's some sort of anthology that's just dancing around the, the fringes of this particular film who is jamal why does he have this guy's number it's all told out of order like pulp fiction <laughs> right you just cut back to john travolta sitting on a toilet in the mall bathroom you're like wait a second what's going on again i thought he was already dead any of you fucking kill butts move i'll execute every last motherfucking one of you so after he hangs up the phone a killbot rolls up and says show me your identification and mike pulls out his id and shows it to the killbot and he says flat to barack and knock to and it's this jumbled reference to the day the earth stood still mm -hmm. and then the, the killbot just shoots mike with a sleeping dart yeah, it's real oh there comes the day and then out comes the claw so you're like oh mike's eating it leslie decides to get up and put on a shirt and she walks out into the mall and she's shouting out for mike she's like mike 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 the douchebag are you there and then the movie cuts back to ferdy the nerdy and allison our final girl and they're still on the couch watching tv while rick and linda continue to have sex in the bed behind them and ferdy's like what's up with these two all they do is fight and have sex like when were they fighting somewhere around the time that vincent vega <laughs> was taken <laughs> Uma Thurman out on the date. And then Allison says to Ferdy, thanks for not trying to have sex with me. You're one of the good ones. And he's like, uh, no, I'm just homosexual. <laughs> that's okay i feel like you don't know what that means of course i do you silly so do you want a blowjob or no. no 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 you don't understand i i'm just not attracted to women and because i'm a homosexual well, i'm not attracted to women either we have a lot in common how about i just sit on your lap and wiggle around see what happens nothing nothing is going to happen <laughs> you're silly anyway we come back to leslie who's going to the cigarette machine and she's wearing her playboy bunny brand panties with the little playboy bunny <laughs> ears on the ass she goes to the cigarette machine doesn't see that mike is just leaning against the wall on the other side of said cigarette machine yeah his legs are sticking out in the light I mean, these are clearly Mike-shaped yeah. legs. And finally she notices. She's like, oh my God, Mike. And she pulls him forward and she sees that his neck is slit and starts pumping blood out. She takes off running. And then a killbot shows up and gives chase, not even giving her a chance to show her ID. And this killbot, Bo, starts firing pink Star Wars brand laser beams at her. But it's Star Wars Stormtrooper level accuracy. Well, it's moving, you know? That's fair. And so is she. So yeah, that's, that's hard. But it does shoot her in the ass, which is pretty yeah, funny down she goes but she makes it back to furniture king as all of her sex loving peers look out the front window and Bo, what happens Dude, next this thing fires a laser beam at her head and it explodes like a watermelon with an m80 shoved in it it is pretty great it's like scanners i mean yeah and when you're watching this movie because nothing like this has happened so far it kind of feels like a modern day pg-13 film like oh they're gonna pull their punches and her head boom 
just blows up. It's pretty good. And then we see another Killbot coming down the hallway and everybody in the furniture store is freaking out. They blast through the glass doors and just start shooting up the place. I like that the second Killbot blasts blue Star Wars brand laser beams and the first one has pink colored Star Wars brand laser beams when they're shooting them around. That You could hire these Killbots for a gender reveal party. Like if they shoot a pink laser and you kill somebody, it's a girl. If they shoot a blue laser and they kill somebody, Somebody, it's a boy isn't that fun and it would be a, about as safe as your regular <laughs> gender reveal party we only had one exploding head in this gender reveal party not a wildfire that displaced thousands I listened to a podcast called The Decoder Ring, and they tell the secret history of things and why they happened. And they did one on gender reveal parties, and it all started with a single patient zero of a woman who made a cake and did a gender reveal at her home. And it was published in this soon-to-be mommy magazine that was subscribed to by pretty much every obstetrician's office in America. And they did this one little feature story, and because every mom to be read about it it just took off no pun intended like wildfire and the interview with the woman she was just like i regret ever doing that she's like this is all my fault the more you know da, 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 da. sort of like the guy who invented the shopping mall of like i unreservedly reject the fact that i invented right. this in i fucked place. up i am so sorry it's on yes. me my bad i was trying to do something good <laughs> and and i fucked up isn't that how most things go that is the title of my autobiography <laughs> I was trying to do the right thing and I fucked up. Uh, I was telling a kid today <laughs> at school because I mold young minds, Chad. They were like, man, I keep trying to do good and I always get my own way. First of all, that's good self-awareness. Second of all, welcome to life mm -hmm. where you're just constantly trying to do the right thing and do good and you just end up fucking it up for yourself. Yeah. I mean, I put it slightly less profane sure. than that, but I told him like, hey, that is 100% the rest of your days. Get used to that feeling. So back in our movie, the Killbots, they blast through the front doors of Furniture King and everybody inside, our remaining six living humans, they all uh, rush to the back room. It appears that they're safe for a moment. And then Ferdy tries to call for help, but doesn't he know that phones don't work in horror movies, Bo? That's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. So then suddenly it's midnight and the whole mall goes on lockdown as the metal doors close on this facility. And I thought, I can end this movie right now. Just start pulling fire alarms. That's a great idea. And you're done. The phones don't work. Yeah. Just keep pulling fire alarms. They'll show up. But instead, Chad, what happens is that Allison is like, hey, how about we all get up in this air duct? And the plan is chad we're gonna climb through the air yep. ducts take that to the parking level and get in the cars and get out of there which isn't the worst idea right. or fire alarms but the, are there fire alarms in the air duct we'll go find them like, all right have at it ladies also the killbot shed who are outfitted with some sort of plastique explosive yes are about to blow open the door mm -hmm. apparently that's just a bonus you get if you order three yeah you also get the plastic explosive. you got the security door you got the three kill bots now you got an option do you want different colored lasers no upcharge yes pink and blue got it all right now another question do you want focused laser functionality a lot like what you see your supermans uh that have that's a yes with that you're also going to get the plastique explosive squirts out a tiny little dollop kind of looks like somebody milked a bull then they fill it up with a long wire knocks down a door aren't they trying to prevent doors from being knocked down and you're viewing this the wrong way <laughs> A criminal taken off the streets is a criminal that is not on the streets. They're not called killbots on accident. We sell them is that they're just going to patrol and call the cops. They're going to murder everybody. I don't know why I would want it then. Why wouldn't you want it? Because we, we have a, just regular people come to the mall. Have you ever seen someone killed in front of you and then you get a murder boner? It's the greatest <laughs> feeling in the world. I love on the brochure, they've got bullet points <laughs> of why you should buy these kill bots. Like additional security, security doors if you buy two, multicolored lasers, murder boner. Psychological aphrodisiac. Like, what does that mean? Oh, you'll find out, buddy. You watch these things in action, man, it's going to be high noon. You know what I'm saying? Oh, my God. I love it. 
love it so much. It's also crazy how close we are to the end of this movie. It's almost over. So the guys end up having to run while the girls are in the ducks because the killbots blow their way into the place. Jeez it, it's the killbots. Feats don't fail me now. And the girls are starting to really sweat it out in the vents. And Susie is having a good old fashioned freak out in there <laughs> where she's like, oh my God, my boyfriend needs me. And they're like, Susie, what the fuck are you talking about? We're almost out of here. All we got to do is keep going and we're going to get out of here. Oh man, those robots must turn on the heat. They know we're in here. Yeah. Like, Susie, shut the fuck up, will you? Chill out, baby. Chill out. All right. Be cool. Be cool. Be cool like Fonzie. What's Fonzie like, Susie? <laughs> cool, correcto mundo. <laughs> Meanwhile, the guys are hoofing it to Peck and Paw Sporting Goods. I get it. For guns. <laughs> <laughs> C. Heston's Second Amendment Emporium. <laughs> right. Hunter S. Thompson's Shopping Mall. <laughs> it's very subtle. And so they end up having to bust the glass to get in. And this place is just ceiling to floor with automatic weapons and shotguns ammunition all open to the public like you can just take it off the <laughs> shelf load it up and start murdering people like from a modern perspective it is shocking that there are this many guns and bullets but what's even more shocking is this was probably pretty accurate <laughs> absolutely i also like the fact that there are several propane tanks that you could use because you know why would you want a gun without an explosive of some kind <laughs> this feels like a level of from left for dead 2 <laughs> yes. you know chopping them all like oh i I get it so it's zombies and robots interesting and so rick is like we're gonna send those fuckers a rambo gram and you're like oh right 80s of course everybody had a rambo joke how awesome would it be to get a rambo gram where he's just like i, ho I heard it was your birthday another day older i want you to know that death is coming and there's nothing you can do maybe you're wondering do you get to win this time yeah they drew first blood well you get to win this time happy birthday Jeanette. All right. Do you get to make a wish this time? Yeah, you do, because it's your birthday. That's right. Remember, to survive a birthday, you got to become a birthday. I don't know what that means, but a happy birthday, Deborah. All right. <laughs> then Richard Crenna shows up in the corner. He's a birthday machine. We made him that way. You ever go to Cameo and look at how much celebrities are hawking their whatever broader personality and voice and whatever to people? <laughs> Not one time, Chad. It's an awesome game. You got to go in, get somebody you know and love, and you just start throwing out names and you, figuring out how much they charge for a cameo. Although I've never been on the website Cameo once. And I'm not. That's not saying that there's anything wrong with it. I should. I just never have. But someone I know got a cameo from the Kids in the Hall's Kevin McDonald. Uh huh. And it was fucking epic. Kevin McDonald went all in on it. It wasn't just a, I'm going through the motions. He went full Kevin McDonald on it. And it was a thing of beauty. But you're recording like a minute. Okay, here, all right, right now, ready? Dean Norris from Breaking Bad. Uh huh. How much is he charging for a cameo, do you think? 100 bucks. 200 bucks. Okay, all right. John O'Hurley from Seinfeld and some game shows and I'm sure something else. What's he charging? Oh, okay. All right. John O'Hurley, 150 bucks. 200 bucks. Fred Stoller. Remember Fred Stoller, the stand-up comedian? Yeah, What's yeah. he charging? 250. 35 bucks. What? You can't afford not to get a cameo from Fred Stoller at those prices. <laughs> it is one of the best games ever to go through and just look at these people and to see like who is so not desperate for cash. I get it. Like this is doing comic cons without having to go anywhere. Joel McHale. 250 bucks is the going rate right now what yeah, that's not terrible the guy who played one of those twins lewis mancada i don't know which one of the twins he was he's 100 bucks to wish people a happy birthday dave foley is charging 100 bucks from the kids in the hall i saw him do one where he did the full soliloquy of being the worst doctor in the world <laughs> that's fantastic when i searched for dave foley mick foley professional wrestler came up his is 149 bucks it's crazy, man. It's a blast to go through and play who costs more, this person, that person. Is Henry Rollins on there? There's no way, but hold on. No. All right, that makes sense. I don't know why he would ever do that, but I would also love. I can't imagine that he would do it. The most expensive cameos that are out there right now, Kevin O'Leary, the guy from Shark Tank, he wants $1,500. Oh, go fuck yourself. Okay, yeah. come on. <laughs> you took the words out of my mouth on that. There's a bunch of Ice <laughs> T wants 600 bucks. Nope. Robert England, 500 bucks. I get that one. 
Don Johnson 500 bucks? Mm -hmm. No. It's crazy, man. But the bad thing is, is that once you go to Cameo and you noodle around for a little bit, all of your social media and targeted advertising across websites is going to be 100% Cameo for the next six months. Yeah, that's fine. You're going to use that money on bullshit anyway. Why not get Eric Roberts to <laughs> tell you what a good job you're doing? That's why I need Kevin McDonald. Is I just need Kevin McDonald to give me a pep talk. Mm -hmm. and whatever he's charging it ain't enough and then every time i'm feeling a little blue chad right you know you're an evil evil white boy right or just like hey man i, I know you've had a really rough time with your illness and you know your family having you know financial problems but um <clears throat> i got you uh, a two-minute video recording of ernie hudson doling out some pearls of wisdom great great <laughs> he's the best ghostbuster but he didn't do nothing but he's still ghostbuster let's finish this oh movie. yeah yeah they're all strapped up with guns and ammo they've got like crisscross ammunition on their chest it's all ridiculous just firing bullets wildly into the <laughs> air chad that's how they draw the attention of the kill bots and sure enough one comes around the corner and they get in a good old-fashioned gunfight where it's shooting lasers they're shooting bullets the bullets <laughs> don't really have much of an effect they throw a propane tank at it yeah and then they shoot that and the thing goes up like a roman fucking candle yeah, and you're like, oh, that's one down, two to go, but don't get so confident. But first, we got to cut back to the vents where Susie is still freaking out. Is like, Greg needs me. And they're like, Susie, would you shut the fuck up? That's it. I'm leaving. And so she just kicks through an air vent and drops down into one of the stores. And Allison and Linda, they follow suit. It turns out they're in a Sherman Williams, I'm guessing, paint store. And then the guys decide, hey, we need to go get some more of those propane tanks. That worked pretty good. We need some propan or some butans, one of them. And Greg's like, wait, I've got an awful, evil, wonderful idea. <laughs> While he's taken off, Susie is determined to go find the guys. And the girls decide, like, well, we're going to arm up too. Yeah. And so they're grabbing anything that they can use for a weapon. And then you see, Chad, one of the kill bots just kind of backs into this little alcove and powers down like, hee hee hee. They'll never <laughs> see <laughs> So while that thing's hiding, the guys are trying to pry open this elevator. Yeah, it's a stuck elevator. I'm like, what's your plan here? To get inside and be trapped? We'll get to that. And then Nerdy Ferdy is like, hey, guys, do you think that the Killbots can read our minds? And they're like, what? <laughs> no. What are you talking about? He's like, I don't know. I guess they could just do lots of stuff. And I was wondering if they could do that too. And they're like, would you just shut up? You're not helping anything. Linda then shows them how to make some Molotov cocktails out of gas containers and rags, which seems self-evident to me but everyone seems real surprised like a combination of gasoline and rags huh i like that these gas cans are full of gasoline and on the store shelf of a mall yeah well this is the same mall that has like fully armed m16s and explosives allison stashes a road flare down her shirt in in the midst of all this which will come into play later at least the movie's phoning that in and i was like what is the name of this store like pyromaniacs are us <laughs> yeah and when she tucks it into her bra you're like oh okay i get it we're gonna and i just want to say this reminded me a little bit of that first toy story but i absolutely adore that movie and when woody takes the matchstick and puts it into his pistol holster and you're like oh he's gonna use it at the end of the movie and when he strikes it to light that rocket and that car immediately blows it out it's, it's such great writing it's such a head fake to lead you down this alleyway and then to just sucker punch you in a direction you don't see coming yeah. i adore that movie. it's pretty good original toy story good movie and, and i will happily debate that i think toy story 2 is a superior film hmm it's yeah. good it's good i think the whole original trilogy is quite good i saw that fourth one i don't remember anything about it as far as i'm concerned toy story ends with all of those toys holding hands and riding that shoot down into hell that is where the movie ends for me i stop it right there you just turned it off and you're like well there we go that is the end of the toys in a fitting end they all told each other how they felt about each other they had some closure in their relationships and then they all died and that's fine my son came to me and asked me what would happen if you left a crucifix fix with the toy story toys i was like i don't know but that sounds interesting <laughs> you're gonna walk in it's gonna be upside down that's for beginsies <laughs> i'm sure he read these online he came to me and he said if one of the toy story toys died and then andy comes in like is he just playing with a corpse like do they get rid of it <laughs> like, these are all valid questions 
I like where his head's at. And you know what? Like father, like son. What happens if you take one of those real dolls and throw it in the Toy Story room? <laughs> See, well, it ends up pregnant. It has a Mr. Potato Head son. I read a story on the internet the other day about this guy who came into a house and he was an EMT or something like that because a dude had died in the house and they took out his corpse because they knew he was dead because of the stink, I'm sure. But then the guy who was the EMT or the cleaner or whatever, he eyed a real doll in the house and he got arrested trying to break into the house not once but twice to steal this real doll and he did steal it and i'm sure he had sex with it but i was like you know what he came up with a plan and he executed on it good for you perverted weirdo oh back in the movie chad <laughs> the, the kill bot that we thought was blowed up not uh, blowed up at all it just no. gets itself back up and is like oh boy that sucked where are those punks it's like every car in Grand Theft Auto. Just wiggle your stick left and right, and suddenly we went from being flipped over to back on our wheels. Ferdy the nerd ends up wiring the elevator to work while Greg and Rick are making more bumps from these propane tanks. But even though he's got it working, he can't get it to go up or down, but he can open and close the doors of the elevator, which seems like a real half measure to me. Sure, that's not what we need it to do, but go on the girls are going to find the guys and the killbot that was hiding out he 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 comes out of the alcove Susie screams and it goes chasing after her the guys hear this but while they're coming to see what the ruckus is allison tosses one of her molotov cocktails but the robot just drives through and starts firing its lasers again. And so the guys are kind of chasing after the sounds of the screams. And then Susie falls. And rather than even remotely attempt to get up. Right. Just lies there and is like, no, no, please mm -hmm. don't shoot the gas can in my hand. Which is, of course, exactly what the killbot does. Yeah. And then Susie is mysteriously replaced by a stuntman on fire. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Who tries to get up. And it's kind of gruesome, though. Like, the fact that you see ostensibly Susie, although this looks nothing like Susie. It's like a 250-pound man who's working <laughs> right. for scale in a sandwich. It's like me in a burn suit. Just, like, slowly <laughs> get up like, oh, Christ. Oh, yeah. boy, my back. A little help here. We're knocking off for lunch after this, right? <laughs> the, uh, them cupcakes for anybody? Were you concerned that the mall is now on fire? I mean, earlier I was talking about pulling fire alarms for funsies and to keep you alive. Here, there is a full-blown ring of fire six to ten feet across burning this carpet that is completely made of combustible materials and a burning corpse beside it. Well, I wasn't as worried because ground chewing gum just shoved into a carpet doesn't burn. It's actually flame retardant. And so, given the amount of just trash and gum and snot and semen, like, all just soaked into this carpet, it's not going to burn for long. It's going to yeah. burn itself out pretty fast. For what it's worth, it's flame special needs. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Please try to keep up with the times. All right? right, I come from a different generation, Chad. You're right, though. You're right. And honestly, I'm glad you said something because I want to learn. I want to be better. I know you do. I know. You're always working on you because if you're not working on you, how are you going to be able to help other people work on themselves? A hundred percent, yeah. What are we talking about here? Oh, yeah. So we're, now we're down to five. Susie dies horribly. As far as deaths in this movie go, it's the head getting blown off. Mm -hmm. But that's quick. This one's slower because you hear her screaming for a while and it's pretty gruesome. And the guys show up, pop off some shots, and then they finally just start running again because the killbots are just firing lasers left and right. But they do 80s action hero running gun style. Yeah. Like it's run, 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 and then turn around like with one arm and like... Brrr, right. Brrr. Yeah. Linda, Ferdy, and Allison are on the second level and they lure one of the killbots chasing them into the elevator, which the guys end up closing the doors using their wiring rig. And then Rick pumps the elevator with propane leaps to the second floor and the folks on the top floor start shooting but it's allison who ends up having to like give me that with one of the guns yeah and shoots the tank which explodes sending it hurtling the elevator as a whole hurtling down the shaft and one presumes killing the killbot or at least putting it in the garage 
Right. Or on a level that doesn't have an escalator, it can ride up. Mm, stairs. The kryptonite of killbots. Everyone looks at Alice and she's like, my dad's Marine. What do you want me to say? And they're like, I don't know, but that sounds like another movie I would like to see based on half uttered <laughs> phrases in this movie that allude to something more interesting outside the frame. The team goes back to the restaurant where Allison and the late smoldering Susie work, where Susie used to work. And Greg is drinking another beer, trying to forget the smell of his one true love melting into that carpet and then rick and linda they're at a table contemplating life and linda says according to my calculations provided we survive the night we're gonna be in hack to this place for the next 85 years does linda think they're gonna have to pay for all the damage they've done what a dummy rick says well we're gonna have to raise our rates and all of this makes no sense like the mall is on the hook to you right like you are the one who is about to get a really sweet payday <laughs> like if you can survive the kill bots you are never going to work another day in your life greg who's a little drunk he's like why did you leave there vince you were safe there and allison's like whoa 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 gregorino this was Susie's idea to leave plus she kept filling up the air vents with her post-sex farts she told me that she holds them in when you two do it and she lets them out afterwards and they're rancid she once told me her sex farts made her throw up it smelled like eggs but not real eggs like those egg products that some people use that's what it smelled like only rotten i know what they smell like she thought she was hiding under the covers but i can always smell it. and also it was her dumb idea to come out of the vents <laughs> in the first place greg we would be in the parking lot and away from here with the police on the way if it weren't for zuzi freaking out dummy because of you Greg. Ferdy chimes in uh, hey guys wait a minute the master computer is on the third level if we shut that down it'll shut down the killbots according to the screenplay <laughs> right. and then greg he's all liquored up and he's like a computer huh? let's go crash the fucker worth pointing out they only think there's one killbot left because uh, they're yeah. not aware that the second one has gotten up yet i'm glad you brought that up because that doesn't matter <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't it's not like they kill the next one they're like shoo we're safe and then another one shows up just two more show up and they're like well <laughs> how about this they don't know that there are three total maybe there's yeah, maybe there's true. 25 yeah well maybe <laughs> because chad they saw the colored lasers they were like okay they bought three because that's the three package right and also i saw dick miller with a murder boner so it's definitely the three <laughs> killbot package so the four remaining characters is it four or five what do we have it what's greg ferdy allison and then linda Rick, and Rick. yeah it is five you're right they take off running through the mall and the killbots give chase the team goes and hides in a women's clothing store that has a metal door that comes down like it's some check cashing place in a questionable neighborhood <laughs> and then the killbots start using their superman laser beams to cut through the metal and then our final characters they're inside arguing over whether or not they should split up which they probably shouldn't but then they all immediately apologize and say you know what guys it's been a stressful day with all the drinking and exhibition is sex and now the kill bots plus we saw one of our friends set on fire and another friend bounced off the ground oh wait was greg still alive no greg gets knocked off the ledge by a kill bot and he yeah, bounces off right. the ground that's right so greg's gone and he leaves the movie pretty quick as noted by the fact that i just forgot that it happened so kelly gets hit in the arm also by a laser before that they bring matter. the shutter down yeah you're right are they wondering where mike and leslie are at all or are they just assuming that they're dead they saw leslie's head explode but they don't know where mike is i guess they assume that mike died in, in the first place or maybe they just don't care for mike very much i could see that mike is a real douchebag maybe he's alive maybe he ain't regardless not our problem the killbots cut through the door of the women's clothing shop and before they fully enter allison says if the killbots want target practice let's give them some targets and she nods her head over to some mannequins we cut to a bunch of mannequins that have been set up as decoys while the fellas are just firing their guns at the killbots as cover and the killbots apparently cannot discern between mannequin and man and apparently their laser beams bounce off mirrors because one of the blue lasers ricochets back and shoots one of the killbots making it go all higgledy piggledy and then the killbot starts spinning around and firing laser beams all over the place and one of these shots hits linda down goes linda I'm like is she dead or alive who knows and then rick's like linda my wife and business partner who wears sexy lingerie you bastard and then he jumps on this tiny little circle service cart and goes at like top yeah. speed of seven miles per hour and crashes into the kill bot and it explodes so rick and linda are now dead but rick at least died destroying one of the kill bots so that's 
not nothing. It's like that scene in Austin Powers when he's going to get run over by that slow moving cart. Now only Nerdy Ferdy and Allison are left. Yeah, we're down to the final two. And he's like, it's time to find that computer. Let's split up. It's Allison's idea to split up. Because I think that she's worried that murder boners are contagious. <laughs> and so they wander around and Allison gets spooked by some hardware that falls out of the ceiling. And then there's a comically full closet of duct hoses and scrap metal that she opens up. Then finally, a killbot sneaks up on her and she screams. And then Ferdy comes running and he shoots it in the face. And it starts moaning about like laser malfunction. My eye got shot. I'm going to kill you bitches. <laughs> and then Ferdy, out of bullets now, throws the gun at him. Like you used to see in those classic Superman movies. Ferdy throws a fire extinguisher at it too, and it catches it, just throws it right back at him. And knocks over Ferdy. Ferdy catches it, and he, like, clunk. I'm like, is Ferdy dead by getting knocked over by a fire extinguisher? He's out for the count, at least for a while. Allison sees this, and she runs off, because she's our last girl in the movie. She busts into a pet store. Mm -hmm. where she hides under some puppy bitch like one of those bitches where you sit to hold puppies and kitties and whatnot that you might buy yeah and the killbot is looking for her but she has pulled like some dog food bags in front of her and it's being real sneaky <laughs> imagine reading this screenplay like you're gonna make this oh yeah you have backing you have financial backing to make this movie uh-huh <laughs> uh, all right, all right. <laughs> After she's hidden behind all these dog food bags, <laughs> the killbot comes in and just starts bumping into aquariums, knocking over aquariums filled with like spiders and snakes. It's real Temple of Doom. We all saw that movie last year. We know how this goes. That's exactly what I was going to say. It is <laughs> Kate Capshaw. Like, Indy. <laughs> <laughs> and of course they're crawling all over allison snakes and spiders and whatnot until the shot where she gets out from under the shelf and then they're just fake rubber spiders that fall off in hilarious fashion <laughs> also hilarious in this moment if you ask me mm -hmm. the fact that when she gets out the killbot leaves with this like real <laughs> kind of sound <laughs> you know because the vacuum cleaner function is turned on sure did you notice the name of the pet shop i did not it's roger's little shop of pets oh little sure i think tippo I the hat that. to mr corman and his directing of little shop of horrors the old yeah, black and white one yeah that's a good movie it's okay and uh, you know that's also dick miller as well i think he's in there somewhere i'm sure and jack nicholson that's a bar bet you can win is jack nicholson in little shop of horrors yes he is it's not a great movie. It's interesting to watch. It's a fascinating cinematic tidbit. It's not a movie you're going to watch for entertainment. So Allison runs off and the remaining killbot, I think there's just one left, mm -hmm. comes after her and Allison decides to seek safety by hanging herself off of the railing three stories high in the air. Like I kind of <laughs> thought right. Allison was the smart one. I mean, this is one of the dumbest things I've ever seen in a movie. Well, she can't hang on forever, Chad. No. And ends up slipping and crashing into like this big parasol that's been set up. And while she's hobbling on the floor, crawling away, the killbot is heading downstairs like, ha ha, got you now. Right. And then she finds the flare in her boobs. Oh yeah, what's this thing jamming me in the chest for my three-story fall? Right. And then she, just head first, Chad, goes into this paint store. Uh -huh. through the glass just head down charges it like a bull well she pulls her shirt over her head so that she can protect herself as she uses her skull to smash through this thing the hardest part of her body she starts just spreading paint and paint thinner and stuff all over the place and the killbot follows her in and she has done an end around and slips outside and says have a nice day like all the killbots say right right and then just tosses the flare inside and everything in the world explodes it's like a action hero walkaway shot i mean the storefront just blows open and so she's limping away and then you just hear hey and it's ferdy he's alive and he's like hey nice shot and then they run into each other's arms and nice shot she didn't shoot anything she threw a lens flare into the paint store also ferdy is holding a full toilet paper roll that's soaked in blood i hope it's blood i hope it's his blood that's something <laughs> he just found in the toilet stall like hmm 
Yeah. <laughs> Let's take this for a little bit later, uh, late night fun. But yeah, they see each other, they rush and they hug and then fade out the end. Yep. There is a pretty good shot. The the shot of them hugging, it's a kind of a crane shot inside the mall. And it's one of the better shots of the, the movie. Hunter Buck says that that was from a guy holding the camera with his hands while his buddy held him off the railing by his legs. Probably so. We pad out the runtime with some sitcom style action shots of the primary cast, like turning to camera. Hey, you caught me in the locker room again. It's like the closing credits of Police Academy. Like, they're all just like turning around smiling at the camera. What are we doing here? They're into the movie, but Chad, all things being equal. Yes. This movie, it comes in under 90 minutes. It's the shortest movie we've ever reviewed on this podcast. Without in credits, it is at 72 minutes. It goes by in a flash. There's a pretty good head explosion. Mm -hmm. The fire effects are pretty good. It's silly. It's dumb. It's free on YouTube. And at least when I watched it, they left in all of the nakedness and all of the swearing. So get while the getting's good. You can watch this on any number of streaming services. If you want to pay a buck or two for it, you can do it that way. Or, or just watch it for free like I did. It's on Plex and Pluto and all those like free streaming apps and stuff like that. So you can find a decent copy of this to watch just about anywhere. And it's a pretty fun movie. It's it's not that. great but it's it's an okay time and it's a great party movie where if you have this on in the background and you're having a, a couple of beers with some friends and you're hanging out kind of bullshitting and you can just perk up like oh my god look it's her, her head just exploded why are they all fucking in the same room i don't know this is all silly and weird <laughs> it's got that kind of vibe where it's a fun excuse to hang out and goof on a movie a little bit and it's short enough that it doesn't wear out it's welcome it no. gets to the kill bots in plenty of haste so you're not sitting around waiting for the movie to get started because there's just not enough runtime to dick around i think it's not a great movie by any stretch but a kind of a good time for a b 80s horror techno thriller it is what it is, and it ain't nothing more. Yeah. I want to say that for the big finale of this season, we are doing something, but we have never done in the history of Pick 6 movies. We are going to review a movie that, at the time of its recording, will be in theaters. Ooh, that sounds difficult. Well, it's also going to premiere on a streaming service. We don't have to go see it in the theater. Oh, that's much easier. Right. I am speaking of the video game turned cinematic event Five Nights at Freddy's, a movie inspired by the popular pizza chain entertainment franchises of the 1980s, including Chuck E. Cheese and Showbiz Pizza. I like at least two of those things. <laughs> Have you played Five Nights at Freddy's? A little bit. I played the, the first game a little bit, yes. I watched a full YouTube explanation of the Five Nights at Freddy's canon mm -hmm. with my son, and you talk about fan fiction that is just off the charts. It's totally bonkers. I don't know how much the movie's going to get into that or whatever else, but my son and people of his age, like young teenagers, I think this movie, which no shocker is coming from Bloomhouse. I think there's only three companies that make movies anymore. It's like Bloomhouse, <laughs> yeah. Disney, and Paramount and A24. That's it. Those are yeah. only people making movies anymore right now. And Bloomhouse got their hooks into this one and they're making a movie and people are excited. I'm mildly interested to see what they make of this. Again, I didn't watch your fancy lore video but i know what i've seen of five nights at freddy's and it seems a little thin in the way of story oh there's a lot going on oh is there really there's a whole backstory there's a feud between two different pizzerias and uh kids start getting killed by robots it's a real something as far as i kind of try to remember hey, should i watch this should i bone <laughs> no, up on the okay no, no 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 all right look i'll get it fresh in the words of one of our great newsmen fuck it i'll do it live and i'm excited to watch this premiere just before halloween and i'm sure it'll be great i'm sure it'll be well, one of the best horror movies i've ever seen it will be the second bloom house movie that we review this season mm-hmm 
And to really get you excited, it also has a PG-13 rating. Oh, yeah. So none of the blood. None of the good stuff is going to be in there. Oh, boy. That does not sound great. No, it doesn't. Not at all. All right. So anyway, as always, like, rate, review. You can reach out to us at pig6movies at gmail.com. And we're here and there or whatever else. Bo, any final thoughts you have on Chopping Mall, a.k.a. Killbots the movie? Get me out of this vent! Yeah, I'll get you out of the vent. Let me ask you a question. You know, I'm milk a bull. <laughs> you like ride escalated? Well, she like to ride. <laughs> Where are you going, sweet cheeks? Come back here. <laughs>